start with lunch. Yep. I apologize for you. Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our first budget workshop for this evening. Um, if you all rise, we'll start our meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> All right. Um, welcome. I uh, wanted to start off by saying that two weeks ago I gave a small little first glance of the budget and didn't say I was wrong, but a lot has changed in two weeks. Uh, things that we're all experiencing in our own lives also, but um, just, you know, when we when I did a quick first glance, we still didn't have a lot of spending. We had a lot of major stuff in there. Um, uh, we didn't have a lot of the teachers' uh, budget requests, um, but now we have all that information in into the budget. We have health care costs. We have uh, everything but a definite on fuel costs. And, the reason why I say fuel costs is when we talked about this before, our proposed increase in spending was about 1.6%. It's two point, almost 2.5 now. Uh, a lot of that is due to fuel. I'll say that right now. BOCES costs and fuel costs. Uh, we do, uh, we go through about 95,000, well, we budget for about 95 to 100,000 gallons of diesel or heating fuel each year, and then we budget for an amount of diesel fuel for the buses. and. That price right now, we were at about 220 a gallon. We locked in for this year. I have no idea where this is gonna lock in for this year. We do a cooperative bid through BOCES. They went out to do the bid. They scrapped the bid at this point. They wanna wait and see what happens in the next couple of weeks if things calm down. Uh, it's really mainly due to the uh, issue with Ukraine, Ukraine and Russia. Uh, I know people talk about that. We don't use their oil, but it still goes into the market. So that's gonna affect prices for quite a while. We luckily don't have to pay the tax that you and I have to pay at the pump. The district doesn't have to, but it's still, I can probably see that being in close to four and a quarter a gallon at this point. I know heating fuel, I checked last week, was running about 550 for a household right now, a gallon. Uh, it's also winter time, so it's, you know, it's also gonna be a little bit more in demand. So uh, we're gonna wait and see where we, where we end up with that. So on both ends, on, on heating fuel and diesel, I'm up around four and a quarter or 450 a gallon. So that's doubled what our original, our budget was for this year. So again, that's a really crystal ball. We, we could either go a variable price and, and ride it out or we go <coughs> I've always had great luck with fixed pricing because you know where you stand, especially right now. We're making, we're doing very well <coughs> paying what you would pay at the pump. Uh, but then again, if the variable goes up, <coughs> Really throw your budget off kilter. So, usually by this time we have those numbers. We don't have them right now. So, I'll keep you posted on that. With that being said, we still have a proposed tax levy of about one and a half percent, and our tax cap is about two point eight percent. Much higher. That tax cap is a little higher than normal years. It's just because of the growth factor that is in the CPI is high this year too. So, that has a, a major role in it. So about $515,000, I would attribute probably uh, almost close to 175 of that is just fuel itself. Uh, everything else is basically contractual. We'll go through that. Um, the first sheet is basically just a summary sheet. I use this, this all the time to really kind of, it just takes everything within the budget. Uh, the budget lines, we have about 14 pages of those. I'd rather not go through that with you tonight. So. We'll, a different scenario, just basically a, uh, a recap or a summary. This summary sheet captures everything within the budget based upon revenues and expenses in the tax levy. Last year, just so you know, we were at 1.5% tax levy for actually for this year, and our increase in spending was a little over 2%. So we're about half a percent higher. Um, revenues. 
Again, revenue is about three page uh, document. I com combined everything into one. The revenue stream that the district sees here, we see about a 45% to 46% split between taxes and state aid. Foundation aid, like I talked in the last one, the state aid runs being the highest. I don't know if you're gonna see state aid runs any higher than what we're seeing now. Uh, the, I would say that the state came out of the gate pretty generous, uh, more generous than I've seen in the past. Pretty aggressive about it. Uh, so, I don't, have you heard anything, Kelly, regarding that? I mean, just that they, this conference last week, they still didn't seem like Yeah, yeah, and then uh, we spent some time actually at the Capitol uh, talking to a few people, and we don't, we certainly don't anticipate that that will be any less. Um, there is, there are whispers out there that it could be a little bit more, but that'll be distributed to districts, well, distributed first of all into the education budget, and then potentially to districts on a, on a prorated basis, so. I don't anticipate that the state aid runs will be any less than what we've already seen, which is unprecedented. Yeah, they talk, actually, they talked a little bit, if bullet aid used to be an additional aid that districts would get kind of a gift, once you pass your budget, you know, local settlement or centers would have a little bit of money to give to other districts, that's gone. They talked a lot about pre-K, <clears throat> where there'd be even more money being allocated, so. How that allocates, I don't know, I think it would be more, Districts that don't have programs currently get additional dollars or maybe enhancing the current programs like a two classrooms instead of one. So right. we haven't seen much. Remember last year was the added expansion grant, which was the first year in the runs that we saw UPK regardless of need. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, I know that's what they're advocating for strongly, but whether that appears as additional in that line or additional in the line that's the competitive grant, which we did not qualify, as you recall, um, we just don't know if or where that will land. But. Uh, revenue projections, like I said, basically we end up with about 10% of non, anything that's related to state aid or taxes. So uh, so I had talked to the, two weeks ago that the we were seeing a decrease in aid. We saw an overall increase, but we're seeing a decrease in aid due to the fact that our, we have long-term debt that's falling off. Going back and forth with state aid, because what's gonna happen is you're gonna see a little bit of an increase in debt only because we're still in a band, we still have bands, which are bond anticipation notes for this previous project. We haven't quite closed it out yet. We're basically done with everything. There's a few little things on the punch list. We have not final, uh, finalized everything and sent final cost reports to the state. Once we do that, then we will go to bond. So what happened was, is when we got those aid numbers in, they're not taking into account proposed aid, not on the aid runs. We were able to go back through with state ed and confirm that we would have additional aid coming in to offset some of these expenses. So one of the things usually we don't see is a 3101 building, basic formula building aid revenue. You see zero in 2122, 22, 23 is 527,000. That is associated with the debt that we're, we're still taking on with the van. We have about a $300,000 interest payment and about a $300,000 principal payment. That was all calculated when we figured this whole project out. Uh, it doesn't deter any of the aid as long as we get our final cost reports in by 1231, uh, December 31st, 22, then we will have a full year of aid coming our way. Uh, if we, for some reason, don't get to that, which I don't see how that would happen, um, then we will end up with a half year's aid, <coughs> reconstruct the financing. It doesn't hurt anything, doesn't really affect, it's just a timing issue. So, revenue, I've actually taken, um, because of that we actually did see a little bit of increase in revenue, but we're also seeing an increase in expense on the debt side, like I said. A few little increases, nothing much. Um, I've, you see a little bit in BOCES A, little bit in transportation A, but not a whole lot. Other than that, we've got a 1.5% tax levy, of about 150,000, sort of equates to. Uh, we've reduced the amount of uh, AL Kellogg only because that would be used uh, for the tennis courts, a portion of it, not all of it, would be used for the tennis courts and the other portion would be used as revenue. And then we have appropriated reserves, which is the very bottom, the 5997 code. That is all the other reserves we have. So one of the things is with this financing that we have with the long-term debt, we had told the taxpayers there would be no additional tax levy or tax burden because of the project, so we will be using additional reserves off of the debt reserve to offset that expense. 
We've also taken a little bit of workers' comp reserve. We have um, uh, some retirement incentive reserves in there, not additional reserves, but just contractual. So we, will, we can use some additional reserves, and it's good to spend them down. We haven't really spent them down. We budgeted and allocated for them. But we've never really, we haven't really had to do it that much, not as much as we budgeted for. Uh, we've gotten through thinking, you know, a couple of years ago, it was 20% aid cuts projected. We put more reserve revenue in there. We didn't have to touch it. They didn't take the 20%. So, and we just continuously built those. So we can spend them down and not hurt what we currently have. And we have an obligation to. Yep. So that's revenues. We did a little summary. We did the revenues. And now I have basically a budget. This uh, is part of a five or six page document stapled. This is, this is kind of the, the 14 pages condensed into about five or six pages. Uh, I'm just going to kind of go through each major budget category and then talk about it a little bit. Let's talk about the increases, what we're seeing, what's driving the increase, what's driving the decrease currently. So, Board of Education is 1,000 coats. Um, we're seeing a slight increase, uh, about $2,400 in this, and that basically has a little bit to do with just contractual costs. It uh, doesn't have a lot in there. Uh, any kind of professional development for uh, new board members or existing board members, conferences, that's in here. Half of the district clerk or superintendent secretary is also in this, 50% of the salary. And then anything related to the election or the board vote. It's all right here. Renting of the units, we pay the workers, we feed them, paperwork and all the ballots cost money, of course, envelopes, things like that. So that's all out of the 1,000 code. Like I said, very small increase. Central administration, the 1,200 code is superintendent's office and everything related to that. So you have superintendent's salary. We also have 50% uh, of the district clerk and superintendent's secretary salary out of here and then any professional development conferences, contractual cost materials and supplies. They're all associated with that office. Um, so there's a little, not much of an increase, I'm just saying it because we also, the, the, the person who's the, the district clerk, secretary, is a lower salary than the person who retired. So you're not seeing, you're not gonna see a 4% increase, you're seeing a little bit of a breakage from that, yeah. and then some of the increase also has it. Carrie, for the Board of Education, I see there's a, a minor uh, increase, uh, but last year, well, the last couple of years, really, there weren't any um, conferences that any of the board members went to. Is that money that we allocated for those conferences, where does it go when we didn't use it? It goes into fund balance. So, okay. So what happens is at the end of the year, everything that's, anything that's not used goes into one budget code, or not a budget code, but actually a, an offsetting code called the fund balance. So you can't, you can't technically take that and say, well, we didn't spend 3,000 last year, so we're gonna take that 3,000 and add it to the budget. Once the budget closes on 6.30, it's done. Okay. Uh, then we take that fund balance, and then we distribute it among our reserves. Okay. And that's, James, I think that's what you were asking about the last meeting, about you know, what, when and how do we determine what that um, underspending is based on the fund balance, right. kind of year to year. And I will say, actually, to answer, we are still working on that, so I don't know where we're going to end up at this year. We're, we just started breaking out fuel costs, uh, what we think we're, we're going to need to get through the rest of the year. And those are pretty big numbers that we can look at and say, okay, we know where our health care is, we know how many bills we have left to go. Uh, we can look at where spending is, and fuel and electricity is one big one. Uh, special education, as we whittle down, you know, Towards the end of the year, we know that if we had three or four additional slots in a post placement, like a 611 or 811, we get three months out, we're not going to be spending all of that money. You know, if anything, we had three slots and three kids walked in, it's only for three months. So we're at that point now where we can start kind of whittling away and saying, okay, what do we have? What, do, what is the, the estimate at the end of the year? So we'll start, we are slowly doing that. Uh, 1,300 codes, uh, finance, that's the business office. Uh, we have three staff members in there, including myself, and then two others. Uh, uh, actually, half of one, another half of one, because uh, the district treasurer is split between uh, the 1,300 code and the um, 1,400 code, which actually I don't have in here. Um, fiscal management, all the WinCap software 
is through our office. It's the HR department, and you know we're kind of the superintendent's office, and my side, and our office is basically a split with HR. But we pay for the software out of our budget. Fiscal agent fees, that's for any filing, that's through, that's for fiscal advisors. Ben Maslano uses his name a lot. He assists the district in any SED <coughs> filing, or any filings with SED, uh, and um, assists with that. So those are fees associated with those. <coughs> we have BOCES, so the co-op purchasing, I talked about the, the fuel bid, that's for co-op purchasing. There's a fee for that. And we have a sub-registry, or they call it ASOP, which is the online uh, absence management yep and then we have forecast five also which is also uh, long-term projections for both academic and financial that's for both seasons. probably the biggest increase that we see in that 1300 codes is associated with the both seasons. Uh, I will say this right off the bat they there are quite a few increases on <clears throat> I would say salary and overhead, two things happened. One was they reconfigured some salaries on the instructional side, did some adjustments that were needed, uh, had to do with the way they were kind of calculating, I think, some of their salaries. They had to basically bring them all into line. The other issue, too, is their support staff contract hadn't been settled for almost five years. They settled it. So we've, we're seeing a lot of increase in in those kind of costs. Um, not that they're adding additional services, it's just they're playing catch up. They had a 0% uh, increase last year. They've said about a 4% to four percent increase. We're seeing much higher in some of these areas. And I'll get to some of those areas later. But, you know, um, co-op purchasing, let's say it was $4,500 a year, is now up to $6,000 a year. Again, they're picking up the slack on that. Again, next year, you won't see that, but you're going to see it all in this one year. Keep in mind that BOCES budgets very differently than school districts do. BOCES don't have the, um, don't have the luxury of reserves and you know, being able to recoup directly from a tax base. So they are funded in, in huge part by the component districts. And so it's important that we understand how they're, they are thinking in terms of staffing, because not only do they meet the needs of 16 component districts, but they also have their own set of staff that, just like in a school district, we have contractual obligations to. Uh, so uh, Perry Dewey will be here at our regular meeting in March to go through the BOCES budget with a fine tooth comb and answer any questions that you might have. Um, but as, as you're seeing Carrie do, we were going to front load you a bit with what some of those increases are, just so that you have a base of understanding when they come and present their full budget. Yeah, I mean, they're not, like Kelly said too, they, they don't have the luxury, so if we don't spend, if we allocate a million dollars for special ed placements and we only spend 800000 with them, they cut us a check at the end of the year for that 200000 so they are not allowed to keep money off the side yeah. if they have a zero budget. Yeah. So, you know, first thinking of that saying, well, four or five years they haven't settled a contract, you think you would have sought some money away to make sure that that big bump that comes, but they can't really do that. Unlike we can do something of that nature, but they cannot. So uh, it was a little shocking. I didn't realize their contract was out that late, but it does happen. So. Uh, support staff, 1,400 codes. Uh, that's legal services. We have two legal firms that we use, uh, Bruce McKeegan, and then we use uh, Hogan and Zarzinski. And then any kind of publications, ads we use. Uh, again, OCs, and that's through our regular two papers that we allocate any ads or classifieds to. OCs is also within that safety risk management. That's, we use uh, that coaster for inspections of the building. We have used them a million times in the last two years with COVID. Uh, so they are, I mean, they're distributing tests to us. They're doing so way more than they were originally their, labeled. That program. But that's gone up. Their support staff, of course, those salaries are not going to go up. So that's where you see that increase of about $11,300 is really associated with that. It's not from the legal services. They haven't raised their, their fees in years. So that's where we see that increase. Uh, 1600 code is building and grounds, everything associated with keeping the doors open basically. Uh, within this is heating fuel, within this is, are all the staff and maintenance 
uh, building and ground staff, uh, supervisors, uh, salaries within here too, telephone, water, sewer, um, and then basic kind of contractual operations. Um, paper supplies, they purchase all the cleaning agents for the district, all the paper supplies, toilet paper, paper towels. So $212,000 increase seems like a lot, almost 15%. I'd say 14% is associated with literally just fuel. Uh, so hopefully that goes down. I'm not sure I haven't seen much that says that it is. 1900 special items. This isn't really anything related to staffing or academics, but this is where our insurance or building liability insurance, insurance, insurance uh, uh, for any liability comprehensive, and then we have property tax refunds. Not a lot in tax refunds. We probably budget about $6,000 a year. Those are just situations where someone gets their bill, they challenge their assessment, even after they pay, they get a refund, we cut the refund back to them. And then we have BOCES capital expenditures. So again, BOCES, you'll see, there's almost a BOCES line within each of these categories. This one really is associated with, anytime they do any kind of capital improvement, we talked about it, they can't put money away for that kind of stuff. What they end up having to do is they go back to the component districts and say, we're gonna do a $5 million project, we're gonna split it accordingly. And so those are pre-approved, prior approved contracts or building um, enhancements that we continue to make. 2020 is, uh, principles, basically um, administration and improvement. That includes two FTEs, uh, building principal and East building, and then office staff, there are three, two in the elementary, one here in the high school, high school, middle school, and then any professional development, conferences, contractual cost materials and supplies. Uh, again, another BOCES line, we do some teacher training. We did a lot of the uh, reading training through um, letters at contract with BOCES. It's easier sometimes to contract with BOCES to get that because then you're going to get eight on it. Our eight ratio is about 40%, which is probably one of the lowest, I think, out of the component districts, maybe. It's pretty low. Uh, but we at least get some pennies back on the top. So we do get eight on it. There's a little increase on that. Um, the homeschool review, I think that'll go down a little bit. Kelly and I talked about it today. I think we have probably about 55 students homeschooled. Yes, we have a breakdown by grade. Um, I don't know how much. I think that number will go down as COVID is, if it continues to be lifted like it is now. All right, teaching. This is all the instructional staff, all the teachers associated with academics or classrooms, except for special education. Special education is under a different code. You'll see that right after this. Um, this includes all retirees that are currently, that we're currently aware of. So when we go back and look at this final number, we're not saying, hey, listen, we have to add back in three more people who are retiring. We have those already included in the budget. You see a decrease here. And I'll tell you, there's a couple things in this. One of them being that you have retirements, you have breakage. So you have people who have been here 30 plus years, you're bringing somebody in on, on step one, or maybe you're not a step, you want steps, but at least starting salary for that year. So you're gonna see breakage from that. We've got a little bit of different, I, Looking at some of the supplies and materials that were requested this year, some of the contractual costs, they're lower than they have been previous year. Uh, Posey's line again is in here. Uh, we have a few little things in here as student achievement. We do uh, English as a second language. We currently, at this time, are not utilizing that, but that could come up at any point throughout the year. So we do allocate about $25,000 a year to that function. Three. All right, we're going to use it this year. So that's where the end. Uh, 2250 is pupil services. That is where the special education teachers are. Uh, some of the, all the staffing associated with that. Uh, administrator costs are in that also, along with the LTAs and TAs that are associated with uh, the special ed or anyone with an IEP one to one aids. Again, back in the teaching, the 2110, LTAs and TAs are in that code also. Seeing a small increase in that. Again, there's a little bit of breakage in areas, uh, not a ton. We had over budgeted, and I would say we would be budgeted a little heavier into that last year, only because we're not knowing what was gonna happen with COVID. 
we had some federal dollars that we weren't aware of, or we were aware of, but not sure if they were all going to come in. So we allocated heavier on the general fund. We were able to back that down a little bit. I will say that there is a pretty good size increase in, we have two other codes within the 2250. One is for private placement, and one is called public placement. Public placement is a student who's a foster student that may, if they, district, the district of origin is Delphi Delaware Academy, and they go to, let's say, South Port, right? We pay for that student's academic expenses. We pay, the, we pay that district. We haven't seen as much, we budget pretty heavy, you just never know, we backed off a little bit on that, but we did see a big increase in private placement. Private placement would be something like Springbrook. Uh, we have we have an additional placement that's a little bit more expensive than normal, so we have increased the cost of that too. Now, when we talk about excess cost aid, excess cost aid is associated with dose placements. So anything above $45,000 that you spend on uh, educating the student in a placement like that, anything above the $45,000 threshold, you get 50% back of that. So you at least get some money back for, for educating. And that includes transportation. Also, you can get uh, some aid in that. Next, 2280s Career and Tech Ed, that's BOCES, that's your CTE, that's your uh, half-day programs. That's going up uh, quite a bit, $117,000. So one of the ways they do it, they used to price it in a way where if you had 10 kids that walked in, you paid for 10 kids each year. They did it each year. Now they do this three-year rolling average, and our average is increasing each year. So it's about $14,000 a student. Now, on top of that, so we have about six, we have six, seven, six more than we did previous year. That three-year average is, is climbing. And at the same time, the overhead and uh, administrative costs that are associated, associated with that also go up. So we're seeing quite a big increase in that, 117000 Kelly, how did that um, cost for a career in uh, tech head mm -hmm. uh, compare to when we did CTEC in-house? Great question. We've got the next section ready. We anticipated that question. Okay. So, um, with first of all, um, as, a, as you notice with background, two completely separate programs, different profiles of students, right? Um, the only overlap potentially was in some programs you could come out with similar industry standard certifications. Um, the difference is with those per student. Um, uh, costs associated with BOCES of sending a child to the CTE program, that's, we get a percent aid back on that. With CTEP, we are paying 100% of tuition plus any related books equip and equipment that go along with that program. Um, and I believe, person, we were just looking at those bills. Carrie, help me remember. I think that full tuition, we were paying 16 per student. It was 16,000? Yes. For yes, student. for a two year program. Correct. Yeah, anywhere, it depends on how many credits you're taking, but yeah, it's about. Yeah. And that was per year. 16. So when you break it out, when we looked at, I mean, it's a little different in the last couple of years because we've had, we had less numbers this year. Right. Only because we had less students that actually, I think, were qualified. Qualified and interested. Yep. So when we had one teacher, Two A's, we were running about twenty thousand a student. You're Correct. taking into effect, you know, the, you're taking into a teacher who's assisting and teaching those core classes when the students are not in the classroom at Delhi, so you Delhi, and then um, an eighth. I would say, you know, now with just four, of course, that's going to break down to much less than that, but it's still going to be probably about the same or a little bit and more. We're for and like Kelly said, per student. you're not going to get any aid on that at all. Right, that so that's 20% out of general fund. Um, but as I've shared previously, the conversations that we've been having throughout this uh, past year and the end of last year is to shift to more of a college and high school program where it's same content, looking at different major areas so there's not necessarily a record or a duplication of, of BOCE services. Um, but the cost would be significantly less. We're moving from about 16 grand per student, and I think in a college to high school program, it was like two, 250 a student. Um, 
However, the, the catch behind that is you need to be able to field um, a class of high school students. So I'm in conversations with some of my colleagues to see if we can arrange more of a region, regional collaboration to make that program a reality so that we can still offer that same outcome to students as we've been offering previously in C at CTEP um, at a significantly greater cost savings. And so also, you know, a little background. We also have kept a staff member within this budget to over mm -hmm. to help oversee that. We you know we don't have anyone in place at this time. We also have contractual costs that we we don't know what it's going to look like, but we have contractual costs which would be where tuition would sit about forty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. So it's not going to be something that we end up turning around and say, hey, listen, we finally found out how this is going to work, but we need thirty grand. We have it right here. So we're we're keeping it in line as far as budget goes until we figure out exactly how it's going to work. Correct. We're keeping that footprint in the budget. So what is the program or programs? that's getting the increased interest at both these? Do we know? I don't know if there's any particular ones that are increased. Um, you know, <clears throat> I just think, I know talking with guidance in the last couple of years, they just had more kids that really wanted to go to the both I know one of the, their biggest program is, I think, heavy equipment, but it's not called heavy equipment. Conservation? It's conservation, I think, is one of the bigger ones, but I'm not really sure. They've don't. added some programs too. They now have programs in computer science and technology. They're um, starting a business, um, like a pre-business administration strand there now. So they've expanded and deepened really the quality of those programs, which has made them a little more um, attractive to, to some students too. Okay, so, and so there's not really overlap with what we have. Correct. Okay, correct. I don't think so. So that's CTEP. Uh, Twenty-six ten library instructional media. That's in, that's both libraries. Uh, just a little. Actually, believe it or not, there's a little decrease in both these expenses. That's what you're seeing the decrease here. And we're not, you, we don't utilize them as much as we we have in the past. Uh, we you know a lot of stuffs online now. You know anything for computers as far as uh, book reports things like that is online. We don't use the courier service or borrowing the materials as much as we used to. So since our students have all have advice, it's very easy for them to get online and to do any kind of research through here. So the little decrease there, that includes the one FTE for um, uh, staffing, and it also includes one TA. <coughs> Technology is the, the next one, 2630. Hold on, did you Sorry. I was just going to say, uh, for the four students that were participating for CTIP next year, they're going through an interview process? That was... It's a telemarker. No, nope, that's not just... Airplane mode. <laughs> Sorry. So we held four students in there for comparative purposes. So that's to maintain that footprint. There's not currently an interview process because okay. we don't know what program they're willing to offer. Um, keeping in mind, too, that SUNY Delhi, they've had significant turnover in all of the people who are managing uh, their programs. I mean, really from A to Z. So a lot of their staff, including the person who is overseeing that partnership, has since left. Um, so I've been in close contact with a person who took her position. Um, in terms of kind of developing this. So again, where you see four students, that's to maintain that book. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Technology is, yeah, everything technology. Uh, we, that has everything to do with uh, replacement of computers, uh, hardware, software. Uh, we do receive some aid for that right off the bat. Uh, that's part of your aid runs software and hardware. It's based upon it's a fixed cost per student. Uh, the biggest piece of that, we have three FTEs for our staffing goes in that. But the other huge piece is the BOCES cost, uh, the 490 cost. So we, the RIC, we talk about the RIC a lot, which is the Regional Information Center, and that's out of Binghamton. That's where basically everything is housed. So everything goes through there, and you can maybe explain it even better than I can, but 
and that one's through BT BOSES. This BT, is I'm sorry, yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, that's a huge cost. Now, we they take care of all the hosting, they, you know, so everything, we don't really host anything on site anymore. Everything's off site for safety purposes. Uh, but that's a pretty good chunk. You're talking, along with that, you have installment purchase contracts. So we allocate about forty-five dollars to $50,000 a year to replenish those devices that come due. Uh, it could be copiers, it could be one-to-one -one devices, it could be touchscreen TVs. We always allocate enough to make sure that we continuously are updating that technology. Uh, but, so that's how that works. Uh, that You're going to see an increase in that a little bit. Not a lot. I mean, not on the BT BOCES one only because they're not, they didn't just settle a contract that was CMO. So. Uh, 2805 is registrar. That's one FTE, small increase. There was a little decrease in contractual cost, nothing much. Counseling department. We have four school counselors. Uh, we are seeing a decrease in that because we have the retirement of a senior counselor uh, who since left and we will be hiring, and I think we've made that choice already, yeah. uh, that we're coming board with, so there'd be breakage within the salary within that. So they work 10 months and then we're 20 days in the summer. Right. We have the contractual costs that come out of this too. That have to do with any kind of social emotional learning. We see a lot more, we budget a lot more social emotional learning costs through the ESSER grants that we receive from the federal government. Health services, nursing. So that's two nurses, one in each building, and any uh, costs associated with that. It used to be a lot higher. It decreased last year because we were basically on the hook, or not on the hook, but we, we would pay for, there was a uh, employee out of DASH that we were contracted to pay for, and then they reimbursed us. That person has since retired. Too, so. And that contract has changed. 2020 psychology services, uh, one FTE, and any costs associated with that. Self-explanatory. Uh, 2850 extracurricular. So that's this is for the stipends for all any extracurricular groups, uh, functions, it's all associated right here. Uh, so for the play or, or for writing club or anything like that, it comes out of this code. Small increase, that, those salaries are based upon almost a step kind of in a way. It's based upon years of experience. So you hit a certain mark, you get a certain increase. Same thing with coaching, it works off the same thing. 2855 is athletics. All the coaches are out of, are out of this code any professional development for staff, contractual costs, uh, league fees, materials and supplies, equipment. The only BOCES cost we have is we, we pay BOCES to process all of the referees and umpires and things like that. That way we don't have to work as an HR department for all. They can go right through BOCES and then we get a little paid on it. They do the processing for us. Carrie, I'm just looking at um, extracurricular compared yep. to athletics and the increase, and both are on steps. One increased 7% and one increased 2.87%. Can you tell me or help me understand why? So I will say this, that one, as far as the athletics, one thing I did talk to Jeff today about is that we are experiencing some high numbers in baseball. So we may see that increase a little bit. Baseball yes. and softball, we're actually looking to add two JVM votes, am I correct? Uh, so that may increase a little bit. The extracurricular, sometimes that increase, is the 7%, isn't always what it seems. Because we always we don't know if we're going to get those positions filled by, you know, somebody's and I'm just, pick, I'm just picking it out of a hat, a writing club or a game club or whatever. We, we don't have game club in there uh, But yearbook club, whatever. Sometimes we don't fill those. So, but we always budget for, okay, we think it's going to be this high. We, it could be somebody that walks through the door that says, well, I have you know, so many years experience or I want this amount. Um, the other so, piece, too, is that we ran, coming out of COVID, we've been running almost all of our athletic teams. We can't say the same for our extracurriculars year over year in terms of spending. There are many fewer extracurriculars maintained their, their status and their activity during COVID. So some of this is making the assumption that most of them are going to run again um, going into next school year. 
So it's not really, I wouldn't say there's it's one for one on each one. It's just the way we have it laid out. Um, you know, you get into mid-year. So I think what you're going to see is that $10,000 expense or increase will probably jump another eight, only because if we end up, I talked with Jeff just this afternoon, late, late this afternoon, we talked about, okay, so we probably should budget for JB, maybe not across the board, but at least for other sports, just in case we see high numbers. And we're seeing high numbers right now, so that may change a little bit. Well, we also discussed uh, that uh, before we uh, allocate a JV team, we had to make sure that there is competition mm -hmm. in our league yeah. for, for that team. I think he was discussing that on Friday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, people transportation, 5,000 code, all the salaries related to drivers, uh, supervisor, then we have sports trips, extra runs, BOCI. So extra runs could be there's a field trip going to the city. That would be considered an extra run. They get paid for their regular run during the day, the morning, and the afternoon, and anything in between is additional expense. Now, I'm sure we're anticipating field trips to start back up again. Yes. Absolutely. Hopefully. Yeah, we budgeted last year for them, or this year, actually, for them, too. But we just really didn't, there's not a lot we could do at the beginning of the year. We have a field trip. I mean, just Proctor <coughs> dropped all their mandates I think, a week yeah. ago. Uh, so I think you're going to. New York City is supposed to drop all of those now. So I think you're going to see that. Under pupil transportation, you have driver training. I thought Mr. Versport was doing that. So he does all the 19A training. There's certain training that he doesn't do. He does all the sit in the bus with them and teach them how to drive. There may be additional training that we bring in from the outside. Um, trying to think uh, what kind of training they may be doing. So in the fall when we do our training, the required all the required state trainings for the entire transportation department, we bring in a speaker from BOCES to do that. We did something similar with the buildings and grounds department. Um, but it's a very small expense. It's not a lot. Okay. Right. No, but you're right. Mr. Versport does all the training with individual staff for the for their CEO. And when Carrie and I were going through this this morning, I asked him the same question. Okay. <laughs> well, we do have that same learning style. Yes, we do. <laughs> Again, this increase about six percent, a little over six percent. It's not. It's really associated to fuel. Mm -hmm. uh, we probably go through. I think we budget about twenty-eight to thirty thousand gallons of diesel. Again, those prices are seem at the pump. They're pretty high. Uh, our fuel, anything for the vans that we have is regular fuel. Uh, we use cards for those. Basically, they're kind of like a charge card. Not really a charge card, but just a, I'm trying to remember the name of it. They call them a certain. Yeah, that's a thing. It's like a charge card. They just bill us later for it. That's all. And then 9,000 employee benefits. Uh, we're actually not seeing, <clears throat> we, we are seeing for the first year, I will say this. So you only see it's a very small increase, about a half a percentage point. Which isn't a lot. One of the reasons why is we're looking uh, there. Some of the retiree costs have, I wouldn't say decreased. We we brought them down a little bit only because we were seeing some pretty good size increases throughout the year, and then we locked in for the Medigap uh, at a year and a half. So we know that we we won't see any increases for well over a year on that. So we were able to kind of pull it back a little bit. That. Pulling that back, we also, but well, we did see an increase on the health insurance for, through Case BP. That's the first time in about four years. So dental and health insurance premium will go up 4%. And that's the first time I think we've been at zeros for the last four, last three years. Uh, which is unheard of. I used to averages of eight to 10 previous year, not here, but in previous years of those districts. So to go zero for three years and then go four percent, it's pretty, it's pretty healthy. Um, so that there will be a premium increase on the employees, <coughs> but the overall cost here is not it's not huge because we were able to bring one of them down. And just so you know, that's all. KCP is a consortium. It's through both seas. There are about sixteen component districts that are all bought into that program. It's a great program. I uh, can speak personally about it. It's, you know, really good health insurance here. On average, our employees pay about 16% uh, through contractual um, 
language and some pay up to 20. And those are usually, that's on the administrative and supervisor side. 9700 is debt service. That is for any project that was voter approved. That's all that's attached to that. Again, I told you it's going to go up a little bit only because we're seeing it's basically just banned expenses. We had one piece of debt fall off, but you've got this new project coming up, and it's a lot higher than the other one was. So yeah, next year, you're going to see it again. Next year, you're going to see it actually drop right off, and you're not going to see anything added to it because we have another piece of debt falling off. But we're slowly starting to build another three and a half million dollar project, and that will come in and take over from that. Yeah. You don't want to see huge swings in that line, which this is not considered a huge swing. No, it's not. And then the last code is 9900, that's interfund transfers. Uh, that's capital outlay. Every year we have a, we're allowed to spend about up to $100,000 within the year for a capital outlay project. We have one that hasn't started yet. We're expecting it to start for probably during spring break or a little after that. And that would be to replace the terrazzo floor that was ripped out up in the elementary when we st first started this project. So that will take up that whole 100000 Not all of it, actually. It should be about three quarters of it. There's the thought that that amount could increase. Yes. Uh, there's a lot of talk. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, a lot of talk. <laughs> they had said 250,000, which I was very happy about, and then Kelly was saying that you guys we were talking 500,000. Yeah. Oh, really? Which would be pretty yeah. amazing. You could get a. I mean, probably 100,000 is you have soft costs attached to that, so you only really get about 8,000 of it. Yeah. So, you know, but the only thing with a $500,000 like that, you have to spend it. If they still keep the rules that you have to spend it in 12 months, good luck. It will it, big... really benefit much larger, wealthier districts. But I think that there's some strategy behind it, too, to grab the attention of lawmakers whose constituents are in those larger, more wealthy districts. Now, you don't have to spend up to that $500,000. You could still spend 100 of that, you know, in an outlay project each year. So, um, but it certainly would give greater latitude as in work that could be done. You have to remember, so the way it works right now is you voter approval on a project, the clock starts, architects design, takes them about, you know, depending on the size of the project, takes them maybe a few months. They then take that and submit it to SCD. SCD then may sit on it for anywhere from eight to 20 weeks. Then they, gotta, then they have to go out to bid. Then you have to you know, phase in contractors and order supplies. Now you're in a, probably March. And now you have to get the work done. And if it's outside, good luck to that, too. Right, so right. And you have to have it spent by June 30th, or at least encumbered. Yeah. So it makes it very difficult. 250 would be probably a really good sweet spot. <clears throat> so that's the budget, in basically, in a nutshell. Um, we currently have a balanced budget, zero. We're, we're not looking, there's no shortfall or excess at this point. Uh, so feel confident about that. But each year I think that we need to look at what I call push the needle and look at maybe adding something or talking about among the board what they'd like to see and what we, there's additional things we probably could do to offset some of those expenses. Uh, so Kelly and I put together basically we're going to put scenarios together. We only have one scenario right now, so just give me another week. We'll have two scenarios. Uh, that's a one and a half percent tax levy that we talked about. Uh, again, balanced budget, and then from here, there's still a lot. I mean, not a lot of work, but there's still work to do on the budget. We have all the staff requested. At this point, I've gone over with. I've met with most of the administrators. I have not met with Crystal yet, and I'll meet with her. We've kind of gone over really quick some of the requests. We go back now more of a fine tune call and say, okay, is this legit? Does this really need to stay? And again, this is also time to say, well, if it's going to be a new tuba that we need to buy, can we do it this year? So this is where we now take the fine tune call and try to break that out. And each year, what we do is we will start looking at equipment and say, hey, listen, if we can scratch, take $25,000 off this year's budget, then that means even, or for next year, then that means even more than we can spend going into next year. So. We'll do that. The next big step, too, is really looking at, okay, where are we going to end up at the end of the year? Right, so we started breaking that out just the last couple of minutes. And so probably by next week, I can come back and say, hey, listen, these are pretty, some pretty 
good items that we can take off the top. I don't think you'll see anything for building a ground for transportation. I, I spoke with both David and Greg, and there's nothing really sitting out there at this point that I know that we really need that we could take out. I think it's more, I would look at it more from the academic side and some of the equipment. There's been a little bit more equipment requests this year, going into next year, and a lot of it has to do with the what if of a lot of the a lot of the furniture that we pulled out of this building. We have three tractor trailers loaded off-site with all the furniture that we had to take out of these classrooms to get them six feet apart. Tables, classroom carpets, shelving, stuff like that. That when we open those, we don't know what condition those items will be. So we may need to be looking for replacement for some of those things. I'm most worried about the carpets in the classrooms, you know, the area rugs the kids sit on for reading centers and that kind of thing. I would suggest we really are serious about replacing those because I doubt they held up. I Other furniture, I think, you know, I was going to send an email out to staff this week just to say, listen, just we kind of like to wait to see how this year progresses before we unload them and then have to load them up again or you know something crazy like that. So we're kind of just sitting back and waiting. Uh, once we get an assessment on how things are gonna roll out and continue, I think then we can start planning, you know, furniture, equipment, um, refresh. I would say the rugs, the carpets are really important though, and that is an easier thing to purchase, get them in here, kids sit down on the floor, it's more comfortable. So I think that that, to me, probably is a given. The rest, we could probably wait and just roll something out and get a plan together. More the, we pulled a lot more stuff out of elementary than we did here uh, in, the, in the high school. In fact, we've got, we have a lot of extra stuff here that we probably could use and utilize in other rooms. Elementary is completely different. It's very tight. But we'll do our best to help out with that. So. I think that's really what we'll see next is seeing what we can purchase this year uh, and offset the budget. Uh, we could increase tax levy. Every quarter percent increase is about 25000 Best way to look at it. So when you look at the summary sheet with the first scenario, um, when we talk about balanced budget, basically what that means is these first two lines you want your projected, as you're building an expenditure budget, it needs to, at the end of the day, once things are finalized, match your anticipated revenues. And then you have a balanced budget. And it's the responsibility of the board to, um, you know, along with the superintendent and the business administrator, to determine a responsible tax levy <coughs> to propose to voters. Um, and then when they go out, when you go out for the budget vote, they're not voting on the details of the budget that we just presented to you. They're, they are giving us authorization to spend this amount of money in the way that we have proposed to the community via all these budget workshops. So you can see that this is well under the tax cap, which is calculated this year to be at 2.8%. I think that's, that's super responsible. This falls in line historically about where we land year over year. Um, and you know, without needing to go to to the cap. So regardless, at the discretion of the board, there's still some wiggle room within there. Um, but we know what our community, you know, has historically supported, and what is reasonable uh, to ask within this balanced budget. So a few other things that that we have been tossed around as potential additions, and you know, as I throw these things out there, no decisions need to be made. But these are just things that we'd like the board to, to consider as we move forward. Also, we are not suggesting that the totality of, of these additions come out of additional tax revenue. So this is not an argument to increase tax levy. These are just other things we're considering. And before we attempt to build these into the budget somehow, we need to know kind of get a temperature check of where the board stands in terms of supporting. Um, the first one is consideration for a middle high school assistant principal. We've also talked about assistant principal slash um, athletic director, which is different than athletic coordinator, um, or dean of students slash AD. Now that, uh, that Crystal's been with us, I've asked her to really capture kind of what percentage of her day is spent uh, addressing and responding to student discipline. Um, and she's easily 
between 60 and 70 percent of her day, um, which is not uncommon and appropriate. And things are being handled expeditiously and appropriately. She's building relationships with students and families, applying restorative practices. So this is not it at all to say that it's lack of skill. Uh, but the other piece, too, is we also need, as we agreed to during the hiring process, we need our high school principal to be an instructional leader. And knowing that coming out of COVID, we're going to be hit with a lot of accountability measures will be returning from, from the state education department, along with changes to APPR. And right now, between student um, addressing proactively and reactively student discipline, in addition to just the minimal required observations, she's running around like crazy. Um, I know that this question came up earlier in the year when we were first searching for a principal. Um, I believe it was uh, Sean who had asked the question if this is something the district wants to consider. And at that time, I had gathered a lot of regional information for you on administrative structures um, throughout our region. And Delaware Academy is by far by far has the greatest administrator to student ratio, but also I, it may be the only district in our region that is as thinly staffed as we are administratively without any assistance. Um, so now that I have additional information from when the question was originally asked, I would advocate for the board to consider supporting um, that, that position uh, for the coming year. To me, that has the greatest sense of urgency. Um, so, or that if if we do consider those things, yes, that would increase our tax levy cap, or it would be more than one and a half percent, correct? Um, not necessarily. So that's not what I'm suggesting. So these are what I'm sharing with you are just additional potential things that we'd like the board to consider. But in terms of financing this. It would not necessarily have that could be an option, Lucy. I'm not recommending no, that I, option. I wouldn't want it. No, and I'm not recommending that option, which is why I kind of put forth that disclaimer, you know, at the beginning. Okay. There are other areas within the expenditure budget that Carrie and I can continue to to play with and look at other creative ways with COVID dollars and such um, to offset some other costs, at least temporarily, to support um, to support these positions. So no, it would not be a one for one. We're not putting this 100% on the backs of our taxpayers. I think what you really need to think about, because we, you know, I said we're, we have a budget that balances right now, but we still have some work that we can probably achieve. We can look at spending out money, you know, trying to alleviate some of that pressure going in next year with dollars this year. Fund balance. That's our funding, fund balance. If we're gonna put more into reserves, can we, can we add more reserve, you know, can we utilize more reserves to offset it? The thing that I think you really have to think about though too is, you can do it this year, but you're going to absorb it next yeah, year. Yeah, long term. When you go to your 23, 24, now that FT is, he is in there, you know, are you not going to fulfill a retirement somewhere else? Or are you are you okay continuing that FTE that's been added? So that's the only thing you really need to kind of address. Right. Think about. And for the occupational therapist, presently, is that through BOCES? We currently contract through BOCES for an occupational therapist. It's about a 0.8. Uh, FTE worth of work, and that cost uh, flat out is close to a hundred grand, but that is uh, that is before um, before we are aided back. But even when you consider BOCES aid on a full salary, there's only a small percentage of an FTE salary in BOCES that you can recuperate that aid on. <coughs> so it's really any expense beyond, like I believe, it's thirty-five thousand dollars in a salary. So it's, first of all, it's percentage of that overall salary that you then get your BOCES aid back on. So it's an even reduced, smaller percentage exponentially. Um, and we're kind of at a breaking point now where if we hired in-house an FTE closer to a starting salary, because they do fall under um, teacher salary, then um, we would still be saving a little bit of money. And be able to bump from a 0.8 to a 1.0 and consider additional supports in district at our primary level, I'm going to glance at Kristen, <laughs> pre-K, kindergarten, to do more improvement services. Um, and actually have her push in so she's not pulling small groups of students out, but actually working with the entire class. Right. Um, 
Just to give you an idea, we that cost according to their budget right now, this is BOCES budget went from eighty six thousand to one hundred and three thousand. No added services. We didn't go right. from a point eight to a one. That's just right. their cost. So when you really break it down, you're looking at probably if you were to bring somebody in house, you would be paying the same, almost the same as a one one point oh FTE. By the time you take into A, because it works the same right. way as excess cost, you've got to hit your threshold, and then anything above that, you get 40% back. Correct. So, again, adding that, you absorb it each year. So, but then again, not paying the BOCES expense either, so it's kind of a yes. wash. But it's something to think, we, we've really been kind of treading on this for a while, talking about, okay, do we increase the, we need more? Well, how much is that going to be? And we've looked at that a couple times, both with PT and OT. But in this year, now we've seen that the cost of BOCES was more significant than it had been in years past. Right. So it really makes sense to consider that in this year. Were, were we talking about getting um, a social worker as well, a part-time social worker at one time? No, we had, when we had, uh, when we were struggling to fill that third, um, or the fourth counselor position, we were thinking if we had, if we reconfigured at that time and considered a social worker instead of a counselor, would we have a better opportunity to, to I guess, cast a wider net for talent. Um, but um, we just this past week had another round of interviews and we have successfully found somebody that will be on the agenda for March 28th. So yeah, really great news. The only other piece, um, this technology teacher, this doesn't necessarily have to be in this coming year, but this is something that we need to be thinking about is expanding that department in particular. I'm looking at James because he was just, um, we used to have a capital project committee meeting where we walked through some of the instructional spaces that we are considering updating, um, probably in our next larger project, but maybe little bits and pieces over the next two projects. But that comes hand in hand with expanding our instructional offerings as it pertains to those pre-engineering, um, you know, robotics, that type of technology classes. When we're designing spaces for prefabrication, fabrication, and then um, you know, actual production, kind of A to Z. And um, we definitely need to consider adding an expert in that area to work with our students. So that's something else kind of down the line that, that I will be asking that we really consider uh, since we're making a commitment to expanding kind of uh, that pathway to graduation. However, we need the space prepared for that as well. So I'm kind of watching both of those happen in parallel, knowing where we're headed long term, and just wanted to put that out there as, as something that we do need to start thinking about. The sense of urgency is not as, not as much on that one. So it sounds to me, well, and maybe I'm not seeing this correctly, but uh, the additional technology teacher perhaps might be part of our concept for our next building project because we need more space and... We have the space, we don't have the right tools and equipment. We're, we have the vision, yeah. right? right. Um, and then it kind of becomes a chicken and the egg. You commit to building the space first and then find the talent to bring in the talent, to dream it with you, and to start getting students engaged and ready and can be providing some classroom instruction. I mean, on, yeah. on our laptops that we currently have and have them starting getting familiar with CAD software and design software and those kind of things with existing equipment. Um, and how does the timing intersect with all of that? Well, to me, it seems to make more sense to have the person first so that you don't end up with this all these wonderful things and nobody, nothing to do with it. Or we can have the wonderful things that more somebody coming in too. Like, like wow, look at this, this is my dream. Yeah. That attract good talent. Yeah. Like I said, chicken egg. Yeah. What I would say though too is that, you know, that space is not going to be cheap and I don't know if it would be, uh, if maybe we have a portion of it included in the next smaller project. But the majority of it, I think, would be in the larger project that we the majority build. Would be for sure. Yeah. That could be three years off. Mm -hmm. you know, so, mm -hmm. you know, that, and maybe that's something again that we look at going into the 23 24 budget. So, 
definitely in, uh, when you're thinking and maybe it'll be three years off, I'd like to see um, uh, Delaware Academy go in and that better technology for our students because that's going to be in the world. It is ready. <laughs> Right. Yeah. right. Any other questions? Um, I've got a couple things. Yeah, James. Um, so I wanted to go back to the CTEP. Mm -hmm. um, currently, we do not have any students going into it, you said. Correct. And it's funny that the hypothetical for students at 30,000 a piece, roughly, a little more. Um, I just personally, I've had it, I think it's nice that we do it, but I don't feel it should be a taxpayer responsibility to pay for somebody's college education. But our taxpayers should be paying for their high school education. And it would be easy, if there's no students currently involved, it would be an easy $130,000 that you can scrub. taking funds this year and then taking a portion of it next year. Next year, year. Yep. But the cost of the tennis courts has come in less. So I'm assuming this 50000 is interest. Yes, it is. So if the tennis courts are coming in, give or take $70,000 less than anticipated, how come we can't put that interest back into, it was at one point used as for debt services? So I'm actually looking at this in a very conservative manner. The market is also taking a hit. So right. I don't know where the interest is going to land. So I just looked at it. I mean, even though it's coming in cheaper, I don't know that for a fact. I mean, not that it's coming in cheaper. I, I know that. But as far as how much interest is going to be earned, I think that that's what you're... Why are we allocating more interest to it? Is that what you're saying? No. Why, why can't we just use the 10% principle? that we've allocated, and then keep the interest towards debt services. So I believe we're, we're allocating principal two years in a row. We're allocating a portion of principal and interest. Right. Yep. But prior to using the interest towards tennis courts, it was being applied towards debt services. It was. Yeah. So, this, and this, so some of this is being applied. I'll, you know, let me go back to what I presented and then break it up. That was I had a multi-year, so I can bring that and share it up with the board again. Just I don't want to misspeak, and, but I know I had broken it out and show we I had that showing exactly how much principal in the first. You had this a three-year year year proposal for that year, when it was specific yeah. to the application. I just I see what you're saying, but let me grab. I can get that for you. Question on on CTEP. We have no students like moving from one year to the next year still. We we have that was that ended in this year. Okay, so our current ended. seniors okay. finished out that program and as was, it was originally in set. And there was know. nobody, no new group going. There we did solicit interest. I believe there are only two students. One decided not to, and the other one decided that a program through CTE. Uh, was a better fit. So we didn't have juniors who were in, or I'm sorry, uh, sophomores who were interested last year to feed into that program for this year. We also knew that we were going to take a year to reconceptualize that, um, and that's where we are right now. Okay. So this point is very valid. Absolutely. And not knowing where that new program will land. I will anticipate that there's going to be some cost savings associated with that, much to your point. Do you anticipate this program having a staff or an FTE attached to it also, or 
um, a shared staff potentially. So as we talk about developing our school to work um, kind of pipeline and that work-based learning program, um, in the position that was previously held by Abby Losey um, in that position, we just maintained that position, if you remember, in the current school year's budget so that that could develop into a work-based learning coordinator, not just for that program, but to address the needs of all of our students um, as more and more experiences open up for students in their senior year locally um, to be able to get some work-based learning or internship experience. So the, that position will oversee the entirety of that program with maybe just you know, some instructional components um, in-house. So it would be, still be probably half of an FT would be allocated, or less than half would be allocated to that. But, we, but that's already, that's not new money to the budget. Right. But we won't know prior to budget time. We may or may not. We may not. I'm going as quickly as SUNY Delhi will go. And if the board is not comfortable maintaining that footprint, then, I mean, we can. This is, again, just still in its developing phases, so. I think it's nice to have the opportunities for the kids. Um, I think I've seen over the years that we've kept some kids in school. <laughs> By having that for them available for them that we may have lost, um, but if we can do it in a much more fiscally responsible way, that's even better. And SUNY Delhi is is I started to mention this thought before. There have been so much turnover um, in their staffing there and also within their programs. They've pulled out of several other iterations of um, uh, college and high school programs. Uh, some of their concurrent enrolled coursework, they're no longer supporting, so we've gone to other colleges for that. Um, and they've alluded to an inability to continue to maintain that program as it, as it was. Uh, but understanding the importance and what that has done for students in our community, Lucy has spoken to the same thing. Um, that has, it has it's been what's motivated the district to try to continue to find a way to creatively have something that replicates that um, for our students. Well, I'd like to uh, see CTEC uh, begin. Uh, I do understand where uh, Mr. Tucker is. Uh, coming from. I also think of the students who would never, whose parents do not have the funds to go to, to a college and how many of our students who did graduate from CTEP were the first ones to get a college degree and how they are now able to make better than a poverty level uh, income. And um, those I think are our gold stars so in that way, I would like us to keep that option open. Um, it just comes down to, you know, how, what, it, at what cost. It's a, it, and I mean, you could argue you can't put a price on that, yeah, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, well and essentially, it, it, it might be a cost to our district, but really to our society, it's, it pays way over. And for our income level of <clears throat> our area. But so I would like to at least keep it on, on the table. And certainly as I get more details and can break down numbers for you so that you can make an informed decision, you know, we'll certainly do that. Do you think we would be able to get an uh, occupational therapist? Because I know uh, OTs and PTs are pretty rare. <laughs> At a premium. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. But this just would give us an ability to at least post for it. And worst case scenario, we continue to contract with OCs. 
occupational therapists and physical therapists only work with people with IEPs? Um, the they're only uh, in a school setting. They are mandated to work with students with IEPs. Yes, and typically <coughs> budget for and allocate that specifically to that population of students because you can easily <coughs> build a 1.0 activity with that. Um, anything above and beyond that, that gets into more of the preventative services, <coughs> state improvement, OT improvement, really is a luxury these days, you know, to districts. But to, be able to <coughs> potentially be able to do that and still offer a little bit of that with less than or close to what we're paying right now uh, to BOCES for that service is a win-win. And the consultation that they do to sure. a classroom teacher training and they'll go into two consults. Um, so it truly is a luxury to have somebody here out of time. They do a lot of improvement right now. If I could ask for your thoughts on where we stand with the assistant principal dean of students position. Have done that since our prior conversations? Would the certification for a middle school principal or assistant principal mm -hmm. be different than athletic director? Um, yes and no. To be a building principal or assistant principal, you need a school building leader certificate. Um, athletic directors are typically at the um, district level, you need a school district leader. Most people with master's degrees have both, an SBL and an SDL. Or you can be covered under the old SDA certificate. There are a few different certificates that could qualify for that position. But it is administrative. I think it's worth considering the directions that we indicate we want to go in. Have some are somewhat prohibitive without it. See how the discipline can make it very hard to get anything else done. Um, and you're saying it's 60 or 70 percent, but that number can always get higher. And there's a there have been days this past week where that's all she's been doing. Right. I'm not. I'm not opposed to it. I'd like to think it through more on what the job responsibilities would be. Sure. <laughs> and I, you know, without giving a super, uh, well, because we had talked about it before, right. uh, I would like to hold off for at least a year on uh, middle school um, assistant uh, principal. Um, I think, like I mentioned before, I think the taxpayers are going to be thinking that we are um, doing fine with the administrators for the amount of students we have. Uh, I do know the demands are much different than it was uh, in the past, but I think um, I'm glad we're still considering a reasonable tax levy of 1.5%, uh, but I, I think um, hearing that inflation is going up to maybe 9%, um, I just worry about adding an uh, administrator at this time. I, and maybe give um, Crystal uh, another uh, year, full year maybe, and get her input. I wish I thought to ask for the uh, the information that you have given us before. 
So how about if I do this for everyone? And because we also have three board members who aren't with us tonight. Right. I will bring a proposed job description um, to answer your question, James. Um, I will ask Crystal. Um, she's been here just shy of a month, um, just kind of for a, a better conceptualization of kind of day to day time spent, so that we can quantify a bit more. Um, and where those two intersect might give us a clearer picture. Um, and then you may be able to be in a, a better position to kind of make informed decisions moving forward. Did um, Mr. Matthew, and those and the numbers that I had prepared previously on Did Mr. Stuff. Matthew have any insight in that area after his time here with us? He said, "I don't know how we're working so long without this." Yes, he felt very strongly about it. Um, but I could, that's a great suggestion. I can have him and Crystal both kind of work on that together. Um, I, I think it has not been as apparent previously um, just because of the way things were handled in the past. Um, a lot more has surfaced in the past, well, since October. Yeah. I think it might be helpful to get a little input from him because mm -hmm. I think his perspective um, that he can bring from other schools and the environments that Greg did in. Yeah. Is he accessible for something like that? Yes. I'm sure he'd be happy to. Make sure he's wearing a bow tie while he's doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I won't even need to remind him, I'm sure. <laughs> Any other questions? Clarifications? Um, the only other uh, sheet that we have is um, Julie just came in. Thank you, Julie. So the uh, principals and Kristen and I spent um, a day two Fridays ago where we did our midwinter retreat to kind of take stock in how we're progressing toward our goals so far this year and to prioritize our efforts for the remainder of the school year and setting up for summer work. And some of the uh, time spent that day was putting together this spreadsheet that, um, that Julie then took and, and made it look all nice and organized for us. So thank you for that. Um, so you see that these are anticipated numbers uh, for the coming school year. As you can see in here, class of. Um, so our seniors on this chart are our current juniors. Okay. So this is our current number of enrolled students. Uh, we put pre-K at 18 because that's what we enroll because we have one classroom. So our current pre-K class, even though it's 18, based on um, our local census numbers, uh, based on historical trends, based on what we anticipate for kindergarten um, uh, roundup, that's going to be close to 50 for our incoming class of 2035 um, next year. God, that sounded weird, didn't it? Class of 2035. Um, and so we divided that down by anticipated sections that will be needed to accommodate um, and that maintains very responsible ratios, um, you know, also based on the research. We know that the ratios uh, threshold is going to be a little bit smaller at the primary levels than once you get up um, beyond second grade. Uh, research suggests that it's not, doesn't have as much of an impact. It certainly has an impact, but not nearly as much. And historically through the years, the district, you've seen similar numbers in terms of ratios, resting around between 18 and 22 to 1. Um, you know, certainly across grade levels. 9 through 12 you see as NAs because as you go when you get into senior high, that's all course dependent. Um, our average enrollment in course in individual courses at the high school can range anywhere from, I'd say, maybe 14 up to 20 students um, in a class. Some are smaller, some are larger based on unique a number of different unique circumstances. Um, but that's about where we are. When you look at overall trends, um, you kind of see an average leveling off here. Um, you know, from year one to year 12, there's only a differential of about five or six kids. 
So you really see that enrollment kind of steadying. We're not seeing the decreases that we saw, you know, back 10 years ago. Also keep in mind that coming out of COVID, we are anticipating, because we know our families, um, how many students will likely be returning who are homeschooled this year um, for one reason or the other. So that's what you see here. So if you, you can take those numbers and even add them to the current number of students in each of those grade levels. So if the students come back that we're anticipating out of homeschool, if you look at seventh grade, for example, next year's seventh graders, the total number of students in that class will be closer to 65 anticipating those students returning. And then when those numbers are added in, that results in the adjusted ratios that you see on the far right. So we take this into consideration also when we're making staffing recommendations year over year um, and as we are needing to redistribute staff. Another layer on top of this, of course, are all the considerations that are added to the equation for special education. So when you look into out of these, when do the ratios change um, for our students with special needs who are in self-contained placements or you know, where we are loading in um, sections of consultant teacher, um, co-teaching, resource rooms, those kind of things. Um, I think Seth had asked for the specific numbers last time, so we could, we'll make sure he gets a copy of this. And the 50 for kindergarten is based on just what we have so far? It's what we have so far. It's based on previous uh, historic enrollments. Um, it's based on local, um, like local census counts of just knowing who's in what households. Julie, am I missing anything in there? There's 46 actually signed up. Already right. registered. And we usually add to them. Um, right, I'm thinking about just fairly, like sometimes even double digits, right? Yes, yes. So 50 is a, is a conservative, conservative estimate. estimate. That's good news. Yeah. And where do you max out on the ratio? Because it seems like 22 to 1 is, seems high. Not for seventh grade. Not necessarily for seventh grade. Um, but there are districts that you see numbers in the 30s. I mean, I'm not suggesting that we ever approach that. <laughs> um, but that varies from district to district. It varies from school to school, uh, from board to board, what your comfort level is with that. Um, there are boards who say we won't run any courses if it's under-enrolled, if it's less than 10 students. We haven't taken that hard line here because we recognize there's a lot of individual needs that enter that equation. Um, but the same could be said on the opposite end of that. If the board says, look, we want to commit to this ratio and not exceed it, you know, then we're talking about adding FTEs and you know, there's some significant implications at that point. But for our middle level, um, although 22 might be hitting that comfort zone for historically what you've seen in Delta, um, it's really not out of the, out of the norm, all things considered. We would have an A. This is the for the third graders, which is 22 to 1. Do they have an A? No, we do not. Okay. A in our elementary. Julie, at one point, didn't we have a, that one area was two sections? I did. Um, that was when the current. So seventh grade came through. I think. The class is seven, yeah, there's 75 in that class next year's eighth graders. Um, then that wasn't it. Maybe it's the eighth grade that's going to ninth grade with only 48 kids in it. Yep. And we were moving back and forth between that each year too. Like we would have a grade level that would be high and then you may have three sections and that went down to, you know, grade yeah. before went to two and then that one moved up to three. So yeah. we have flexibility there. But. Yeah. We moved between two at the one level and four at the next level. Okay. Uh, yeah. And I think that was a fifth grade. Didn't we have to move a sixth grade teacher back? We did. We did. Yeah. Because then the 44, it was 44 at the time. It's 47 now or 48. 
but it was 44 at the time, so 44 were moving up here to have four teachers was... Over, yes, right. right. So, and so we moved for one year, because then that large class came through right. and we needed four teachers. Large yeah. class. So. <coughs> I can't believe they're a ninth and eighth group. Per <laughs> I, that's my thing. Is I'm thinking they're still up here, you know, six. But well, so Carrie, what information are we hoping to have between this week and next week? So I would say that we would finalize all budget requests for uh, mainly instructional staff. Uh, sit back down with Julie and Crystal and kind of go through them with a little bit more of a fine tooth comb. <clears throat> And in the meantime, really start to break out what we anticipate we're going to end this year. Uh, and that way we can see if we, there's some things we can shave off of this new 22-23 budget within the 21-22 expenditures. So that's, that's kind of the goal for the next week. So, uh, like I said, all the larger contractual costs are already basically figured out. Long-term debt, health care, all of that is finalized. In the past, uh, you've this, uh, told us what you uh, suppose the other neighboring districts are going to. Uh, do you yeah. have a feeling? Yeah, there was an email actually sent out last week that was asking, you know, where people, it's kind of preliminary because everyone else is just starting talks and sit down and do budget, but I can pull that up and get an idea of where everyone else is. For next week, that would be nice. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Anything else that you guys want to see or make sure that we have next week information or? But, you know, I was thinking this data sheet will be nice if we have a retreat in the summer or in the fall to see the gains, how that compares with ratios. Thoughts? Any questions? I know this is somewhat new for you. Yeah. I cannot think of anything at the moment. I feel very informed so far. Carrie's very informed. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So we'll have another review similar to this again next Monday, same time. And then we won't see it again until the next budget workshop in April, where we'll ask to uh, to adopt the budget. We do something you know, a little bit. We'll probably touch base on the twenty eighth, the March meeting. It's not on the schedule as a as a separate budget workshop, but we can certainly yeah, answer a questions. Question. Do a quick mm -hmm. go back update. Anything else? No. No? Okay. It was nice not to have my mask on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. A motion, please, to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Thank you. And a second. James, thank you. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>